Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. If everyone can please take your seats. We're ready to continue with a really spectacular panel to get at the core of the issue that I talked about first thing this morning, which is how do we improve U.S. competitiveness and what does that have to do with our national security? So this is part of lifting our sights to the issues that are a little bit farther out there than the ones that are right in front of our nose, but are they going to be absolutely critical as we move further into this 21st century? And to do that with us, uh, we have an unbelievable lineup. We have Arathi Prabhakar, who is the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And in case you don't understand, this is the front line of where t technology and innovation and science policy gets made in the US government. She is the perfect person for the job. She used to run DARPA. She was a venture capitalist in Palo Alto. There's just no one better to talk about these things. And because we are strictly bipartisan, we also have two senators who are walking in the door right now who are willing, who are happy to be here with us. One is Senator Chris Coons from Delaware, and the other is Senator Todd Young, the US Senator from Indiana, both Senator Coons and Senator Young have been really instrumental in pushing through the very important legislation that's helping the United States stand up and innovate and stay in the lead. The US Chips and Science Act, what used to be called the Endless Frontiers Act, and so they're here to share their views. And no one better to interview them than Ed Luce from the Financial Times. Thank you all. Please come join us. Thank you, Anya, um, for that great introduction. I think we're, we're, we'll start um, Senator Young's in, in the building um, and making his way towards the stage, but we'll start. Um, on this hugely important topic, um, a, a few years ago, it would have been unthinkable to have a US administration overtly declare an industrial policy. Um, you know, this is really a, the first overt declaration of industrial policy since at least Reagan and the first semiconductor challenge with Japan in the 1980s, but I think probably um, more substantively since Eisenhower and LBJ and the, the beginnings of DARPA um, in the 50s and the 60s that led to the internet and so many other uh, innovations. This is, seems to be a very un-American thing, an industrial strategy. I would argue that we've had one all along, undeclared, which is called uh, the Pentagon, but let's not get into that. Um, and so what we've had um, in the last few months is cumulatively about a trillion dollars of investment passed in Senator Coons's um, body up there on Capitol Hill, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction, uh, the oddly named Inflation Reduction Act, um, the Infrastructure Bill. Um, and as I say, a trillion dollars worth of bipartisan support for a trillion dollars worth of investment for um, a declared industrial strategy. Uh, now, this, of course, is all about China, um, and we're going to get into that. But um, let me first start by introducing the two-thirds of this stellar panel that we've got here. And on the far end, we've got Dr. Arthi um, Prabhakar, who's um, the chief scientific advisor to the president, head of the Office of Science and Technology in the White House, former head of DARPA, which uh, I think will come up later in this uh, conversation. Um, Senator Coons, of course, needs no introduction. Um, well, uh, well, um, well, I'm from Delaware on the Senate Foreign Relations Appropriations. I'll just Google, you know, your um, Wikipedia in a minute. Um, but at, at any rate, a, a, a senator who's deeply involved um, in all these issues of U.S. competitiveness and national security strategy. But let me start with you, Dr. Prabhakar. We, we've got tens of billions of dollars for semiconductors. Um, We've got hundreds of billions of dollars for clean tech and infrastructure. Um, and we've got a declared industrial policy framed as a national security issue. People talk, uh, Senator Young, sorry, who I will, um, uh, again, um, needs no introduction. 
that. This is an unusual event. We have a bipartisan panel, and they're going to agree with each other a lot, but I, I'm going to find where you disagree. Um, and, and so, Dr. Pro Parker, that the money is clear. It's been appropriated. It's been passed. What's the actual strategy? How are you going to make this work? Well, that's a big question. First of all, it's a delight to be here with all of you. And um, I think you've highlighted exactly what's happening at this moment. We are in a period in which geopolitics uh, stresses on the American economy and the American worker. And then the acute shock of the pandemic have all come together to bring home something that I think has been visible to many people. We've seen the threads, but now we see the whole tapestry. And we know that there are things that we need to do if we're going to be competitive in, uh, in the world as it is today. And I, w I would cast all the actions that you just described in the context of uh, I've spent a lot of time working in the Defense Department and working in other parts of government. And what I would tell you is that, that our institutions and our mindsets in general are still those that were shaped in the post-World War II era and that, that assume a particular world order and assume that we have decades of technological advantage in every area. And that's just not the world anymore. And actually, it's much better than the world used to be because many other parts of the world get to participate. But it's fast moving and we are now realizing that simply letting it just unfold however it might it leads to consequences that are very significant for every American. And now, we're, now the things you're citing are the beginning of taking that seriously and making the moves that, that turn that ship. Uh, okay, I'm, Senator Young, I'll get on to you in a moment, but let me just um, ask Senator Coons, and following up from Dr. Prabhak, what Dr. Prabhakar has just said, um, and what Jake Sullivan, your colleague in the White House, National Security Advisor, has said in a number of speeches, um, both about these bills, the CHIPS um, Infrastructure and Inflation Reduction Act, but also about the semiconductor actions that the Department of Commerce has taken to cut off the supply of advanced chips um, to China. Now, Sullivan describes this as a small yard with a high fence, um, meaning it's a very specific, limited number of advanced chips that we're talking about will be impossible for China to scale this fence because the rules are comprehensive. Well, that's the, at least the intention. Um, but the yard is small. Um, I guess the, the question that occurs to me is, how can you keep that yard small? I mean, if, if the idea is not to allow China to develop rapidly dual use, civil military use um, technology, there are all kinds of things uh, like drones, uh, like quantum computing, like batteries, um, and, and the list goes on, um, that aren't included on this list, that imply to me a much bigger yard. What, what, what is going to keep this yard small? Um, great question, um, and thank you. Thank you for this wonderful panel. Um, my opening comment is simply going to be to take some blame and give some credit, and then get to the high fence small yard, if I might. First, the reason I was thrilled uh, to get to replace Mark Warner, who was supposed to be offering his great insights today, um, was to compliment Senator Young's remarkable work. We only have an effective, meaningful result out of the legislation in the Senate and the House to talk about because Senator Young, from one of the leading manufacturing states, joined up with Senator Schumer during the same cycle where he was the Republican, actively engaged in his own reelection in, I'm telling you a state secret here, a bitterly divided partisan America. And Chuck Schumer is known for being a warm and fuzzy bipartisan centrist who works across the aisle with everybody. So I want to give credit to both Senator Schumer and his team and Senator Young in particular. We don't make progress like this without someone like Senator Young really sticking his neck out and really working hard. And it nearly didn't happen. So I want to hear a round of applause for his bipartisan leadership on this important issue. And I'm the appropriator of the pair who wants to say, we did pass and the president did sign all those great bills you talked about, but we haven't yet appropriated all these funds. And there is a critical issue facing us and our competitiveness, which is a skilled workforce and taking the CHIPS plus science bill, 
which is now law, and turning it into advanced manufacturing. So yes, the president was out in Arizona. There's a $40 billion new advanced TSMC chip plant going to be built. Huge wins, lots of foreign direct investment. But these plants, whether in batteries or in electric vehicles or in chips, aren't going to run themselves. And we need to tend our own workforce and continue to invest. And part of what we're doing right now is trying to close the gap on what the appropriations omnibus, which is being done in too much of a rush at the end of the year, has to look like. If we don't appropriate this year, we go back to the baseline, which is before all these bills were signed. And then DARPA and NIST and the Department of Defense and the Department of Commerce won't have the appropriations underlying all these new authorities. How do we keep, sort of what should be our goal of decoupling such as it is, is I think your core question, Ed. And I'll go back to what was the framing we were given right at the outset. In the Cold War, technologies were predominantly either military or civilian. There's relatively few civilian uses for aircraft carriers. There's relatively few civilian uses for spy satellites for U-2 planes during the Cold War. Today, all the most critical military technologies are also civilian technologies. Whether it's artificial intelligence, quantum computing, those same spy satellites are now being used routinely by farmers and by um, logisticians and others. There is a convergence, which to your core point makes it hard to identify what exactly is the yard. I'll also say that one of our core foreign policy national security tools of the last 20 years was sanctions that were financial sanctions, that were cutting off countries like the DPRK and, and Iran from the global financial system. One of the key sanctions we are now imposing on Russia is cutting off their supply to advanced semiconductor chips. They're finding some workarounds, but that's how we're constraining their ability to deliver precision-guided munitions uh, in attacks against Ukraine. We will have a hard time implementing this vision, keeping the fence higher through export controls, through partnerships with our core allies who share our values, um, and identifying exactly what the right list is. Um, and we are going to learn um, as a result of the sanctions against Russia because of its brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, whether or not we can do this. And China has been clear that in their view, there will be costs for us um, for imposing a higher fence and a, and a small yard. So we have an uncertain future here, but it is critical if we are going to stay, as it were, one step, not 10 steps, ahead of our national security competitors if we don't execute on this well. So if you only hear one thing that I said today, it was thank you, Todd Young, for leading on a critical piece of legislation, and Chris Coons admits we've got work to do before the end of the year on appropriations. Thanks, Ed. I, wa I want to get into, you know, a little bit later, the, what seems to me the core underlying question here is, is this a zero-sum game now, having been a positive-sum game up until now? And, but let's just postpone that for a moment. Senator Young, you, as Senator Coons has just pointed out, you, uh, I think, led 16 senators to vote for the USICA the, the, uh, last, last July. That was um, um, made it a very bipartisan bill, and it was you who organized that. Um, and I'll say thank you for coming, because uh, you know I'm a neutral journalist. Um, but there is a key question. You're the Republican here, and you were the one who organized the Republicans to vote for this. Um, and therefore, as a Republican, you're more skeptical of public investment and public spending. Yes. What, is the, what confidence do you have that these tens of billions of dollars for chips um, uh, are going to be spent on actually advancing U.S. national competitiveness and therefore national security in these critical areas, as opposed to just rewarding TSMC or Intel or Micron for doing what they were going to do anyway? Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. Um, it's great to be here with the doctor and, of course, my very good friend, esteemed colleague, Chris Coons. Uh, what a statesman. What a gentleman. Thank you so much. Um, Listen, this is, this is a different sort of geopolitical environment, uh, certainly, that, that I've ever thought about, uh, lived amidst uh, in my lifetime. We're all trying to come up with labels uh, to characterize it, 
models uh, to, to sort of lead the path for policymakers? How do we think about this environment? I read something over the weekend. It was, it was just incredibly simple, but I, I think the characterization is something most of us could embrace. This is not just a period of, of globalization. This is not just a period of great power competition. This is both. And it doesn't lend itself to catchy little slogans uh, and oftentimes to um, really firm methodologies about what technologies need to be subsidized here, which ones don't. We're going to have to muddle through and look at individual challenges that we're anticipating over the horizon, maybe if, if we've missed them a little closer than over the horizon, and do the best we can. In this case, this is the small c conservative approach. It was pretty clear, pretty clear when you have the GM plan in Fort Wayne, Indiana, idling multiple times because there aren't enough computer chips, that it's going to be very challenged to run a modern economy in the midst of a global pandemic where supply chains are, are interrupted and computer chips aren't being delivered. Uh, or God forbid, in, in the event of a geopolitical event, uh, which, uh, you know, would result in extended uh, uh, interruptions in, in the supply chain. We need to become more resilient. And the economic model I was taught at the University of Chicago was always let the market take care of it. It was a little more thoughtful than that, but that was the general uh, direction of everything I learned is, is markets uh, are, are, are elegant, uh, mechanisms for normalizing supply and demand, and they are over a period of time, but individual market consumers and enterprises that generate the demand are driven by a near-term profit motive. They're not driven by a broader concern about economic resiliency. In fact, they don't internalize the costs of interruptions of the supply chain. And in order for us to avoid these situations where um, entire economies start to unravel because we don't have these mission critical inputs, government needs to subsidize production internally. It's, it, it ought to be intuitive at this point. We've heard so many examples uh, anything with an on-off switch requires uh, a computer chip these days. But we also, at, at the very moment we look to implement this bill effectively, and the short answer to your question is um, the verdict is out as to whether or not we're going to implement effectively. We need to robustly engage in oversight and not engage in a fire-and-forget exercise where you pass a major piece of legislation then move on to the, the next topic. We need to implement it's one thing to have a business plan. It's another thing to implement it effectively. All the while, we, we have to be thinking, and Chris, I think, alluded to this. We need to be thinking about what's that next thing over the horizon we may be missing? Is it critical minerals? Well, I mean, if, if your country has made a decision through its elected representatives to electrify, we better be thinking back to to uh, you know, all the minerals required uh, to electrify an economy and, and sourcing those from trusted partners, if not domestically, right? And, and, and so how resilient does a supply chain need to be in order to satisfy the American people? We will continue to debate this topic for a period of time. But this is one of these areas where we were running out of time. We had to get started building these fabs um, so that we would never, never again have to have to go through this situation, and we and we planted the seed corns of future innovation by investing heavily in our national innovation enterprise, so that as we manufacture what are essentially commodities with these microprocessors, we can prepare ourselves to make next generation chips informed by our own research. Um, uh, right here in the United States uh, of America. And um, I think we're, we're well positioned as a matter of current law to do that. Now, now it comes down to uh, actually executing uh, within those parameters Congress established.
Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Prabhaka, the, your history is at DARPA. Um, you know it better than anybody here, or anybody anywhere. Um, uh, tells you and, and tells the rest of us that the successes were based on emergency situation, Cold War, Sputnik, you know, um, panic, funding for fundamental research um, that produced all the breakthroughs that we could list. Um, and that then there's a, there's a bridge across the valley of death to commercialize them. Um, but that the real breakthroughs of the 50s and 60s were from government R&D, working with big companies like IBM. Um, this is a lot more about supply chains being repatriated, um, about fab plants being located here. Um, you know, a TSMC, of course, produces in Taiwan, and now they're going to set up in Arizona, I believe. And it'll be, high, it'll be like five nanometer, it'll be the high tech end. Um, but this is, this is slightly different from the previous industrial policy. Can, you, can I ask, therefore, this, uh, a different version of the, the same question that I asked Senator Young? What gives you a sense of certainty that this is actually going to work? Passing a bill is one thing, succeeding is another. Um, certainty is a very high bar. Uh, and, and both of you are on exactly the right point because Congress has done something that I never thought I was going to see, that I have been waiting to see for four decades, which is a chance for us to really have the capacities we need in semiconductor technology. That happens to be where I started my career. So we've actually got a shot with this legislation. And part of the reason that certain, we have not achieved certainty, but my confidence is growing as I'm watching Gina Raimondo, Secretary of Commerce, and how they are moving out and the other parts of government that are responsible for other parts of the program. Um, so, and, and this is something that is a, a very high priority, as everyone knows, for the president. And uh, the steering committee within the White House that I co-chair with Jake Sullivan and Brian Deese, my timing was great. Our first meeting was literally my first week on the job in October. Um, and, and, and through that process, I'm seeing the right elements. I want to tie it back to your comment about DARPA because absolutely this is different. It's about manufacturing capacity and workers in, in those jobs, but then supporting all the workers in the supply chain and those automotive plants so that we know that we're going to have the components that we need. It, it is very different than doing R&D, but what it shares, the successes that we had in the work that we did in DARPA were not because we went off in a corner and did research in some corner of a government lab. The successes came from doing with industry and academia the things that none of us could do separately. That's genuinely the partnership that, that resulted in some major breakthroughs. And that's, it's a very different kind of partnership. But I think a lot of the same ideas are critical because there is, we have a market that is the most efficient machine the world has ever seen for allocating resources once you can see profits and growth. And we want to use industry's ability to do that and to drive the, that part of the partnership. But it's our job on the government side to be clear about what the country needs, which is not just the sum of what these short-term business decisions lead to. And, and I, so I think that partnership uh, framework and mindset is important. I'll just give you one example from my DARPA life that tells you how, how incredibly successful it can be. Uh, Ten years ago this year, I showed up as the director of DARPA. One of my program managers, who, is an M, who was an MD, a PhD, a geneticist, and oh, by the way, an Air Force colonel, said to me um, that he said, it's 2012, and he said, we are going to have another pandemic that looks like 1918. And the bad news is that we don't know how to make a vaccine. It, it takes years or decades or never. But, he said, there is this research in mRNA technology that might be the basis for a rapid response vaccine platform. And I just met a little company in, that just started up in the Boston area. It's called Moderna, and they want to use mRNA for cancer. But I think we might be able to persuade them to think about a rapid response vaccine platform. And I got to say yes. That was, like, that was my big contribution, was simply saying yes. But I, I, I would note that no pharmaceutical company, not NIH, not FDA, not C no one else thought this made sense 10 years ago. And we were able to change their minds by teaming with Moderna and many other companies and academic researchers when we built the first prototype vaccines and got an immune response in people for chikungunya, like a much earlier infectious disease. 
That fortunately happened around 2017, 18, 19, and that's why Moderna was able to ship its first clinical test doses for the COVID-19 vaccine 42 days after we knew what the spike protein needed to look like. And so that's, you know, that's really what a partnership means, is, is we did what we needed to do for the country at a time when companies weren't ready to invest. But then companies came forward, and Moderna and many others came forth with their massive investments in the mobilization that we needed. So necessity, necessity is the mother of invention, um, and Operation Warp Speed, of course, is a really good example of that. And there wasn't much necessity or emergency around I don't know, the Dulles mass transit, clearly, because that took about 20 years, but there was over vaccines. We can do it if we want to. I want to get to a sense of whether that, there is that sense of urgency over China and why, but let's me, let me ask the senators. Can I just make Please. a, a, yeah, a yeah. really quick point? <clears throat> I want to circle back to your question about effectiveness. How can we ensure this is going to be effective? We know as a matter of math that the incentives for chip production in this country were necessary. As a matter of math. As an economist will tell you, someone in a corporate boardroom needs to locate their production facilities where they're going to get the next highest marginal sort of uh, bit of production value out of it. So they, they, want, uh, they want low cost structure uh, and they want to be able to sell it at a certain you know, uh, price point. So uh, we have a global economy, the price points don't vary significantly. Uh, but when you have every other industrialized country or just about every other large economy industrialized country offering subsidies for these fabs to be located on their shore, we're not talking about wage differential decisions. We're talking about something much more substantial here. We had to get in the game just as a governor, if they want to land a major corporate headquarters these days, has to be in the game with the incentives if you want to have those fabs located here so that we wouldn't experience the interruptions in our supply chain. What I think the doctor was... was speaking very powerfully about is something related but also a little different, which is the strategic bets that we have to make and have historically had to make on uh, some of these key tech areas. Not every one of those will succeed. That's not the point. We need to do the best we can in making some of these big bets that pay big dividends that allow you to, for example, uh, develop something to deal with a, a global pandemic in short order. So there, there are two different things we're having to deal with at once as it relates to chips and science implementation. Thank you. And, and I apologize that I have to go back to the Hill. I'm not leaving before I mention two things. Um, Manufacturing USA is an existing partnership that the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and NIST, the Department of Commerce, has a scattered series of sites around our country that combines the private sector, uh, government-funded research and departments, and takes basics, pay, basic scientific research, turns it into applied, gets it to the marketplace, and trains the relevant skilled workforce. And I'm very excited about its potential. Um, follow on to DARPA was ARPA-E. I'm also hopeful that ARPA-H will get stood up and will have a similarly generative and creative, um, more private sector mindset, frankly, than typical public sector mindset towards solving some of our biggest problems uh, in health uh, and in solutions. Thank you again, Todd, for your leadership. I look forward to spending more time with you on this. Thank you. Thanks. Forgive me. I have to leave. Thank you, Senator. Um, <laughs> Senator Young, let me get back to you as, as a Republican um, and your influence over your colleagues on this. So if you listen, um, in my case, indirectly to, to these companies, and TSMC in particular, what they complain about is the lack of high-skilled uh, people to fill positions um, at these very, very cutting-edge, tiny nanometer plants. Uh, this is clearly an immigration issue. Um, this is a skilled immigration gateway question um, that I know some members of your party, and indeed some members on the left of the Democratic Party, are not that keen on. Um, to what degree can you answer that as a basic need for their ability to fulfill um, this. And I should just add as a coder that you know, TSMC has been flying over hundreds of engineers from Taiwan, and they're planning to fly over hundreds of Americans to Taiwan to train them up. But there is an issue there. It is. Um, it, it's a critical national vulnerability we have, which is uh, we're not going to have a sufficient 
uh, supply of, of, of workers to generate the ideas, to implement the plans, and, and to work in these uh, strategically important areas. And, and so not only do we need to not just be thinking critically about, but also changing our laws surrounding uh, bringing talent into this country, especially at the high end and in some of the named and discrete areas from hypersonics to battery storage to, uh, uh, you know, semiconductors and, and so on. But we also need to do what I know a number of uh, leaders in our higher ed community are doing, which is upping their institutional games uh, to ensure that they're pro providing the workers that are, are needed by our country. And um, our K through 12 system, something that rarely gets mentioned in this context, has a lot of work to do, I think, to uh, uh, up uh, its game. And, um, you know, to the extent we in Washington can play a constructive role in moving that along, great. Historically, that's been a state and local challenge, but it's also a national security challenge. And, and so that's sort of the, the, the gamut. But I'm not avoiding your question, as, as many people do when the issue of immigration comes up. This is, this is one of our strategic strengths historically, is, is we're able to welcome people in this country and... and um, you know, encourage them to go out and, and uh, become successful and apply their talents and, and uh, they're full-fledged Americans and uh, let's continue to build on that because I can tell you, we're not having enough babies to grow the economy and I can't think of any public policy instrument that's going to significantly change that. Those are other issues, right? And when you, when you invite talented people in your country, they're, they're innovating, they're creating jobs, they're increasing our rate of economic growth. We, we all know that everyone benefits as a result. Now, I will say as a matter, I'd, I'd be remiss in the political side of my job if I didn't say that I don't anticipate anything bold happening on this front until we deal with the border security challenge. It's just a reality. Okay, so we've only got five minutes left, and I want to ask you both the same question, which we touched on earlier, the extent of decoupling. Now, when the Department of Commerce came out with its semiconductor ruling, um, there was a lot of chatter. The other side of the Atlantic, Europe, you know, wasn't, wasn't necessarily signed up to this or hadn't felt fully consulted. But there was a lot of fear that actually this was a... This was a ruling that didn't just say, well, we want to deprive China of the ability to improve its hypersonic missiles or its nuclear capability, but we want to stop China from developing. That's what a lot of people heard. They heard this was a change from America as a positive sum power to, well, this is actually a dog-eat-dog. -dog. This is like, which of us is going to prevail? Um, is, is, that, is that the wrong way of interpreting this? Because a lot of very, very thoughtful people who listen very closely to the words coming from this administration and from Capitol Hill have interpreted that way across the Atlantic and in other partners around, around the world. Dr. Prabhakar, I mean, we've only got like three minutes, so if I, it does seem to me I'll to be, be a fundamental short. question. I'll be so very if, short. Yeah. I think if you look at the export controls that were enacted, they are extremely narrow, specific, strategic, precise and they don't constitute a broad, uh, the, the kind of broad shift that you're describing. I would also say the positive sum, I'm not really sure, is a good description of where we were if you look at the impact on the American people. That was a, a quick and concise answer. Senator Young. I think the Chinese Communist Party has an opportunity to come into a position of better behavior to increase confidence uh, uh, among uh, the United States and our partners and allies uh, that they don't... Um, they don't have malign intentions uh, towards their neighbors, that they uh, intend to make some significant reforms uh, so that they're no longer manipulating markets, and they're gonna stop stealing our intellectual property and plowing it into uh, their defense investments. If they take those steps, uh, then I don't think this sort of uh, uh, you know, incremental decoupling has to continue at a rapid rate. So you do think that the, the small yard can remain small? I do think what? The small yard, high fence analogy, Jay. Oh, you, sorry. <laughs> this might have sounded like a really weird question. Um, no, <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I heard you describe it earlier, yeah. and I was hoping you didn't ask me the question about the small yard because I didn't get it the first time. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> it was a weird question. You don't. Um, since our time is out, you don't need to answer it. But um, if you if you feel like it, please go ahead. 
No, listen, I, I, I think the point is, the point uh, that probably Jake was making is we want the Chinese people to continue to enjoy prosperity. We want their country to grow more wealthy. But to the extent they intend to keep using that wealth uh, to the disadvantage of the United States, we would be remiss if we didn't defend our people and our way of life. Uh, well, on that note, thank you to Dr. Prabhakar. Thank you to Senator Young. Thank you to Senator Coons. That was a great session.